My fundamental view is the biggest unlock for the sector will come through threading the financial integrity needle. I'm Ari Redboard, and this is TRM Talks. I am Global Head of Policy at TRM Labs. At TRM, we provide blockchain intelligence software to support law enforcement investigations and to help financial institutions and cryptocurrency businesses mitigate financial crime risk within the emerging digital asset economy. Prior to joining TRM, I spent 15 years in the U.S. federal government, first as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice, and then as a Treasury Department official, where I worked to safeguard the financial system against terrorist financiers, weapons of mass destruction proliferators, drug kingpins, and other rogue actors. On TRM Talks, I sit down with business leaders, policymakers, investigators, and friends from across the crypto ecosystem who are working to build a safer financial system. Today, I am excited to welcome what he calls my brother from another mother, Dante Desparte. Dante is the Chief Strategy Officer and Global Head of Policy at Circle. We'll talk stable coins and Dante's extraordinary journey. But first, Inside the Lab, where I share data-driven insights from our blockchain intelligence team. Today, we're gonna to talk crypto hacks. According to a recent TRM report, North Korea stole at least 600 million in cryptocurrency in 2023. This means that the DPRK was responsible for about a third of funds stolen in crypto last year. Also important to note, hacks were down by about 50% compared to 2022, a record setting year. That said, North Korea continues to attack the crypto ecosystem at unprecedented speed and scale. Why does this matter? First, from a national security perspective, North Korea hacks are different. When North Korea steals funds, they use those funds for weapons proliferation and other destabilizing activity. North Korea hacks also impact the safety and security of the crypto ecosystem. For all of us who believe in the power and promise of this technology, lawful users are simply not going to engage if DPRK cyber actors can steal their funds from a crypto exchange, off a bridge, or from a DeFi protocol at the speed of the internet. North Korea hacks are not a crypto problem per se. Hacks are a cybersecurity problem. What we see here is North Korea breaching cryptocurrency businesses and DeFi services and bridges because they have vulnerabilities in their cybersecurity. So tools like TRM used by law enforcement to track and trace the flow of funds add friction to the money laundering process but really, in order to stop these hacks from happening in the first place, we need better cyber controls. Look, North Korea is going to continue to attack the cryptocurrency ecosystem in 2024, and that's because North Korea takes advantage of any vulnerability. But as we build better cyber controls, and as law enforcement gets better and better using tools like TRM to track and trace the flow of funds to add friction to the laundering process, we're gonna see fewer and fewer of these hacks. For much, much more on North Korea, check out our TRM Insights page and TRM Talks at trmlabs.com. All right, now let's sit down with Dante Desparte. Dante, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ari. It's, it's great to be here. And, and frankly, what a year we have both had. There was no debate that I had to be on with you. I feel like we have been everywhere together from flights <laughs> randomly and in airport lounges at really extraordinary events and special dinners. And I kind of really want to get, get into all of that, but would love to kind of hear about your journey to kind of where you are today. There's always these conversations when folks get you on about stablecoin legislation and sort of what Circle is working on, but would love to hear more about Dante uh, as we kind of kick things off. The man, the myth, the legend. Um, yeah, something uh, like that. First of all, thank you for for that. And and it, it is, as I said not long ago in, in a circle advertisement that we put out, it's a labor of love and very personal at the same time. I'm from Puerto Rico. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Grew up poor in the poorest part of the United States, the island of Puerto Rico. And there's something novel, I suppose, about, you know, dealing with poverty in paradise, <laughs> which makes the financial inclusion arc of the crypto narrative around the world, number one, I think, frankly, the most important for the sector and the most personally meaningful for me is, is to be able to say, 
we shouldn't depend on a postal code lottery for ensuring that so many people all over the world get access to what I think fundamentally is a human right and what I know for a fact can be such a powerful difference maker. And so that's like the, the personal part of the backstory. The other juncture for me and the reason that I first looked at this technology as novel was actually from the lens of risk and resilience. And so prior to paying my bills with digital currencies, my real trade and what made me internet famous, so to speak, is work in risk and resilience and global security issues. I'm an entrepreneur. I started a company in the insurance industry. And if you think of insurance as a financial service, when you claim against your insurance policy, it is an unequivocal good. No one complains when their house is rebuilt by their homeowner's policy or their car is replaced by an auto policy. So it's a, it's a financial solution that provides an unequivocal good, even if it is unattainable for many people around the world. And then I spent a, a period of time on uh, FEMA's National Advisory Council looking at sort of risk and complexity at the nation's scale. And all throughout, there is just a, un, a super, super clear necessity as a planet, as a country, as communities to just extend the perimeter of financial services to places brick and mortar cannot go. And that's what I get out of bed in the morning for. Really extraordinary. I was with the U.S. Treasury Department when Libra launched, and I recall very quickly getting on a flight to Switzerland to talk to regulators about how they're going to deal with this thing, right? You know, a stable coin with the reach of 250 million Facebook users, right? It was, the, I think it was the first time that regulators really globally had to deal with the potential of cross-border value transfer at the speed of the internet mm -hmm. and freaked out. Talk to me about that journey for you as sort of part of the Dante story. I'm a big believer in serendipity. And to the extent this new generation of TRM talks also imparts trade secrets, here's one. If you're invited to a background briefing on a major global project or a moonshot in financial services or any other domain, speak up. Don't merely be a witness of things happening around you, contribute to them. And I, I became a part of the Libra project through my connections with the think tank circuit in Washington. Again, entrepreneur in the risk and insurance domain. If you read any of my writings in Forbes, once upon a time, I was writing something like five or six articles a month in Forbes. And if you read my articles back then about Facebook or big tech, they were none too flattering. Notwithstanding that, I was invited to a briefing about this project. And while in the room, my hand kept going up, <laughs> basically to say, you know, this is a powerful project. However, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Have you thought of the other? And in the end, after that briefing, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, have you thought about joining this type of effort? What Libra did in my, candidly, my actual personal calculus was win, lose, or draw, the sheer size, ambition, and scale of this project would be world-changing, even if it failed. And so a lot of my uh, close friends and colleagues were texting me on WhatsApp, complaining that I had so-called sold my soul to the dark side and, and uh, I was a sellout now. And I had to then remind them that they were using a Facebook property to send me an encrypted nasty gram. And that if money, <laughs> if money could also reach the type of scale this project would provide, then we could solve for financial inclusion. And as, as you heard at the outset, Ari, I cared about that and still do more than people disliked Facebook or distrusted big tech. So that was the Libra journey in a nutshell and the personal calculus for doing it. This idea at the time was absolutely revolutionary, right? A stable coin that could reach hundreds of millions of users backed by a basket of fiat currencies and supported by really the leading companies of the world. How did that not work? There are oftentimes ideas that are somewhat ahead of their time. And then candidly, there is a teachable lesson to organizations and leaders around the world around a trust deficit. Money and the movement of money is rules-based. And many a crypto project have come and gone and many a so-called stablecoin have come and gone on the basis of ignoring the pre-existing rules for the movement of money whether it's an area close to home for you and TRM, financial crime compliance, financial integrity, you cannot do that ex post facto. You have to do that at the core of the way you operate. And I think, frankly, in Libra's case, later rebranded as DM, in the case of this project, there was a scale too big for prudential regulators and central banks to fundamentally accept because this notion of money being a public good and the role of the central bank really wants entity-based structures, not consortium-based structures. And Libra, Libra did a lot of things right, though. 
frankly, many things that I think many a crypto company and project who benefited from our heat shield could learn. We asked for permission rather than forgiveness. <laughs> we went to a regulation first posture from the outset. And frankly, we built a consortium where the checks and balances of that type of consortium structure could even put the very biggest of the big tech players in that platform to some degree on the same playing field as the other entities that were a part of it. And when you fast forward to today, I think you've vindicated the role of payment stable coins as a payments innovation throughout the world. Certainly coming to Circle and building USDC together with Jeremy and the team at Circle, it absolutely vindicates that business model. But it also is, a, it vindicates the idea that the regulators and the policymakers also cared about, which is we need trusted counterparties interacting with money and no entity who interacts with money should be able to supersede the rules, the boundaries, not to mention, of course, the financial crime compliance issues as well. And although Libra had an architecture to deal with all of those, scale and a trust deficit of its architecture and parentage were, I think, risks too big to overcome. When I'm asked, I talk about the team all the time. I mean, this was the Avengers, right? I mean, <laughs> especially especially after the government sort of stepped in and started asking questions, mm -hmm. right? You did exactly what a company like this should do, and that is you hire Stuart Levy, right? The former <laughs> Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, the same office that's giving you a hard time. You hire that person to help navigate some of this. You answer every possible question on, on anti-money laundering. So I, I think that the trust deficit was real, and it seems like Circle has corrected a lot of the, the slips. Well, and if I, if I may, at birth, yeah. right? So this year particularly is a, is a great year for Circle because we acknowledge our 10th anniversary. It's also the fifth anniversary of USDC. So as a product, USDC predates Libra. And, and frankly, from a structural vantage point, we at Circle did many of the things inside the United States and in other jurisdictions that were the, just the basic, basic preconditions of a regulated digital currency like USDC. For example, conforming with US money transmission rules. Circle is licensed from sea to shining sea, as I have said in the Senate and in Congress in my prior testimony. And so we conform with the existing rules at the state level that govern money transmission in the country. We were the first company to get a New York bit license. We were, have always been a money services business with FinCEN. And so where the three things that matter most, the three I's I like to call them, financial inclusion, responsible financial innovation, and protecting the integrity of the financial system, the three should not be trade-offs. And I don't think there's a company that has demonstrated that more so than Circle in terms of these three objectives, innovation, inclusion, and integrity, not being financial trade-offs or, or sort of policy trade-offs. We've done all three in lockstep over a decade and over five years of USDC as a company. Not perfectly on point here, but one of my favorite things that I've heard said, you know, last several months, as we've been having this conversation around corporate flight, businesses leaving the U.S. to more sympathetic jurisdictions from a regular standpoint, I've heard your boss, Jeremy Allaire, Circle CEO, respond, I'm American. We're Americans. <laughs> We're not going anywhere, right? Like, you yeah. know, it's like, why don't you go elsewhere? And he's like, because I'm an American, right? And I yeah. think the the three pillars that you just sort of laid out is very much a U.S. company trying to meet the moment, despite maybe not having the legislative clarity it needs today. Well, look, I mean, you could almost joke there are Americans and there are Americans. <laughs> <laughs> very fair. Very fair. Yeah, no, that's great. Jeremy Lair is an American. Uh, he's yep. he's uh, thrice a successful entrepreneur over the course of his uh, impressive journey as a technologist and as a developer and innovator. But fundamentally, I also would put myself in, in his camp as well and in broadly the circle camp, that when you have uploaded the U.S. dollar onto the Internet and in given it the trust and speed and transmissibility of the internet, but you've imported the trust and responsiveness to US policy issues, monetary policy issues, and beyond, then you have to be responsible to the standards set in the country. And while those standards are emerging and graduating from state oversight of money transmission and payment stable coins like USDC to a potential federal framework that will one day be the basis of legislation in the country, we just can't pretend that there are not rules that exist. And so, yeah, very proudly building this business here in the country and frankly, around the world. And this is this is where I would say to anyone who's taking the short position on betting against the United States in this domain is that, uh, number one, uh, we think of our international growth as a yes and as opposed to a 
an opposition decision against the interests of the United States. And we have invested in France, for example, to pursue an electronic money license and a digital asset service provider license in France. We've just received a major license in Singapore as a major payments institution and beyond. And so I think of this in our product candidly as an export product from the U.S., but one that could be advantageous to the competitiveness and growth agenda of many other countries around the world. I know you've testified on these issues. I testified about a year ago before the House Financial Services Committee on just this, you know, American competitiveness sort of in the age of digital assets, electronic payments, et cetera. And at least one of my arguments was, look, 99% of fiat-backed stablecoins today are in US dollars with Circle obviously leading that effort. That is the answer to potential de-dollarization or That's correct. You know, the loss of any sort of you know, hegemony when it comes to US dollar. Is that your thought around national security as well? I, I think of both soft power and hard power. The soft power agenda, of course, is that Libra, as much as it was a catalytic development of, for example, the totality of central bank digital currency efforts around the world, pre-Libra, there wasn't a single central bank that was credibly putting in place experiments on digitizing the national thrift. It just wasn't a thing. Mika was accelerated, the European regulatory framework. I mean, Mika is literally a reaction to Libra. They just took five years to do it. I mean, essentially, sure. right? I mean, that plus also the nation state adoption of blockchain and digital currency and alternative payment systems innovations in the extreme, for example, the Chinese government's development of the ECNY, its direct digital currency payments innovation is also an innovation that has geostrategic elements to it related to alternative payment systems and creating ways of moving money and exporting the movement of money that to some degree are censorship resistant or non-responsive to a set of, be it rules in the global economy, sanctions regimes in the global economy. And all of a sudden, these risks that were once upon a time very abstract that drove what I like to describe as a digital currency space race or more... Um, fundamentally if digital assets 5G wars. A lot of this, unfortunately, was catalyzed by the Libra project, but has since then become very real. And it's neither big tech nor China tech that is ruling the, the emergence of digital currencies and blockchain finance. It's actually middle tech. And middle tech isn't anti-bank. It isn't anti-monetary policy or anti-currency. It's actually pro-innovation in a responsible way. And I think those are the most powerful takeaways of the last five years. We were together at the Digital Dollar Project convening with the Atlantic Council last week, week before. And A, Circle was a big part of that, which is kind of very interesting with the way the discussion is set up out in the world. You know, it's either stable coins or CBDC. But from right. my experience with you, it's actually not that simple. No, it isn't. And despite the fact that I wrote the actual case against CBDCs published in the International Economy Journal, I did that more for sport than anything else. <laughs> well, we're going to have a TRM talks with you and Christian Carlo. It just wasn't go. today, so, but we're so going to so do like, this. Like we could we could put this yeah. to rest once and for all with Christian <laughs> Carlo. And I'm happy we're to do have a conversation with yep. any day of the week. The point is, for the last five years, I think, frankly, the conversation has been a little bit too simplistic and short circuited by every other innovation in digital money being the better version of the mousetrap to the latter innovation in digital money. So stable coins emerge, then deposit tokens become the better substitute, and then CBDCs become the better substitute. And what you find, and frankly, the Atlantic Council Geoeconomic Center's own research shows this, is that where central bank digital currency study advances, sensible crypto policy advances in lockstep. And if you're an outcomes-oriented person like I am and like the folks at Circle are, then what you really care most about are the abilities for people to move money and always have trust in money, irrespective of its form factor. Therefore, the central bank digital currency crowd ought to be a welcome part of the broad payments and policy innovation conversation. And that's why Circle and myself included have always been a part of the CBC discussion. I was there at its birth before it went from abstract to real, but I don't believe Western democratic societies will be well served by forms of digital money that break the air gap between the central bank, your wallet, and how you spend your money. And so not surprising, most Western democracies are leaning on a CBDC architecture that is intermediate. My counter argument would then be, if we get nothing more than a digital twin of the existing banking and payment system, then we failed. 
Then the entire conversation has failed the financial inclusion test. It has failed the open innovation test, and it would have failed, frankly, the financial crime compliance and integrity test that we all have to pass. Money is borderless, it's frictionless, and it is meant to be broadly fungible and interoperable with the banking system and with monetary policy run by central banks. And I think of stable coins, deposit tokens, and CBDCs as complementary products, not as a better solution replacing the other. Focusing in a little bit on the tech from what you just said, uh, another thing I've heard Jeremy say, which I really like, is we have to remove all the tech talk from this conversation. We got to stop talking about blockchains and protocols and bridges. And God knows I try as hard as I can as a lawyer, but you know, I, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not an engineer. I've learned a lot over the last few years at TRM. When does that happen? When does my mom have the Venmo-esque experience on her app? Frankly, look, back in 2018, I even wrote an article in Forbes titled, When We Stop Talking About Blockchain, We Could Change the World With It. And there's maybe nothing more true in our space than that today. That's right. And I'm happy to wax philosophical with you any day of the week on Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms and any of the tech jargon that I've picked up over the years. But all I can say is if the technology is still a protagonist, your technology stack is still in its infancy. And so at Circle, uh, there are a couple of reasons our technology product and engineering strategy is actually in favor of open source infrastructure. Number one, we've enabled us to see across 15 public blockchains. The reason being is that if you consider the, the traditional rails, even in fast fintech environments and payments environments, they all have a legacy debt and a technology obsolescence risk. Whereas this constantly upgradable open infrastructure in the form of public blockchains means that USDC becomes a common denominator across public chains that we've enabled USDC on, but we don't have to pay the technology obsolescence risk or debt that one tech stack becomes obsolete versus the other, because I still think it's still early in approximating visa scale transaction throughput on these networks. But that's an architectural choice that preserves the quest for an open global payment system. You can't do it if the payment system is proprietary to Circle alone. And so gradually you'll start to see blockchains approximate high throughput, no more carbon impact than a basic internet search, but nonetheless the infrastructure is open and can be connected to open digital wallets. That is starting to abstract away the presence of blockchain, cryptography, and all of the frankly lack of trust and high frictions of early crypto payments and crypto economic activity. We're starting to get there. Uh, we've made investments directly, our Web3 services, for example, and the cross-chain transfer protocol are but two technology investments from Circle that start to fade things into the background. One, to me, it's we have to take the friction out of the tech. And two, we really have to be able to argue meaningful use cases. And obviously, the very, very powerful ones that Circle talks about, that you talk about, that that ad is so good on is the financial inclusion, mm -hmm. remittances, humanitarian aid. Let's walk through a little bit the first world U.S. you know suburban use cases. In order for this thing really to scale, that's where we eventually have to get to. Is it something that's going to happen? Right. Well, the answer, of course, is yes. I don't just give that yes because it's the basis of my job security. <laughs> I give yeah, that yeah, 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 mine too. So I, it's something I worry about from time to time. The answer is yes. Just today, for example, there was an announcement, you know, from Coinbase, Circle, and a number of other major companies about you know establishing kind of a political presence to help fund pro-innovation candidates in the 2024 election. There's about 52 million people in the United States, according to you know, external data and surveys, that own this asset class and participate very broadly in crypto. There's also that convergence between the bank and the non-bank entity and payments innovations. And remember, the original policy reactions to the emergence of stablecoins was these innovations should be banned. The next opportunity we had a couple of years later was these innovations should be given to the banks only. The next iteration of the policy conversation was these could be both for bank and non-bank actors. And then today we're at a place where around the world, effectively representing the G20 countries, there's permanent rules on the books for what good looks like. And while America may tend to be a laggard by design in some of this overly prescriptive rulemaking, where we're in so many ways the beneficiary nation, even in the domestic payments environment, for what these innovations look like at scale. And, and so it may not be obvious to people what the use cases will be until you look at the performance of our payment system in stress. And so I'm happy to have a small detour there around how the United States responded to the advent of COVID-19 
and what it looked like when the U.S. had to move nearly $7 trillion with taxpayer-funded money to the whole country. Our pipes basically were broken. And so I think in that domain, you'll see an enormous uptake of digitally native payments. Financial services super apps are not a phenomenon yet in the United States, but I think that direction of travel is coming. And fundamentally today, USDC already is a digital store of value for millions of users around the world. And it's an export product of the United States because most of the world's currencies in the extreme may not be worth the paper they are printed on, or they're just hyper volatile and they don't interoperate with the global banking system. That's the uh, financial inclusion piece. That's the financial stability piece. It's also the soft U.S. sort of soft power piece, right? Eventually, we won't be able to use Taylor Swift anymore. We're going to have to figure out an alternative, and uh, maybe it's USDC. I'm going to take you on a trip to my world as opposed to stable coins, payments, financial stability. We're asked all the time in the context of mixers and anonymity-enhanced services and sort of what's happening on blockchains today. FinCEN just put out a notice of proposed rulemaking a month or so ago on mixers, basically calling them a high-risk category of transactions and looking for higher due diligence from banks. My answer is usually, look, in a world where we're going to have more and more transactions on public blockchains, right, where people have more visibility on financial flows than ever before, lawful users are going to need more privacy in those transactions. However, at the same time, we have to stop illicit actors, North Korea, terror financiers, and others from taking advantage of that technology. That is a hard line to walk. And I usually argue that there are or will be tech solutions to this. How do you respond to that type of line of questioning? My fundamental view is the biggest unlock for the sector will come through threading the financial integrity needle. And you have to also begin with what's the existing problem statement. The problem statement in the aggregate is that the post 9-11 global financial crime compliance framework has not kept up with the technological times. And it's a framework that, while right for the times where it was developed, has all of these other insidious effects and impacts that have effectively relegated entire continents and billions of people to the financial shadows. And if you care about the export of US soft power, then there is no better export product than access to dollars in all of their form factors, including as digital currencies. And so therein lies both the risk and the opportunity. The risk is billions of people relegated to financial de-risking and being on the margins where a single bad actor makes a single bad payment, entire continents are cut off from the financial system, post 9-11 financial crime compliance framework without technological upgrades. But yet we also have another big dilemma, which is financial services has a privacy problem. I started writing about this stuff and really deeply analyzing blockchains as new architecture that were privacy preserving and disaster resistant or risk resistant. After Equifax, the Equifax breach exposed everyone in America and the entire, basically the the whole of the US workforce of 150 million people to natural identity theft exposures for the rest of their natural lives because of the alphanumeric social security number that is never changing and that that was the basis for getting a credit score and the basis for your lifelong financial decisions. So that architecture of cryptography, digital wallets, privacy preserving technologies are important building blocks of a trusted financial system at internet scale. But at the same time, as we saw with the sanctioning of tornado cash, when regulated entities and actors like Circle are a part of the value chain, we could be as responsive, if not more responsive than traditional financial institutions to the emergence of risks. And in the risk domain, one of the powers of blockchain-based financial services beyond the discoverability and beyond having a digital fire brigade like TRM and others is the ability to say we could maximize the penalty on the bad actor through these open networks rather than penalize entire societies and entire populations of people uh, for fear that one bad actor among them makes a bad payment. I think that's the most profound policy choice the U.S. has to make. And I've been encouraged by the nuanced conversations with Treasury, FinCEN, and other stakeholders around those trade-offs between financial privacy and financial integrity. I don't think they're trade-offs. I think they can move in lockstep. I agree. And I, I, I do fall back on the tech solutions, some of which are available today, digital ID, zero knowledge mm-hmm. proofs, privacy pools, which are in vogue right now. I also think we see a lot of regulators sort of going after the truly bad actors in the space while trying to encourage you know, innovation in the places where people are building safely. 
Exactly. And Ari, one more tiny editorial comment, which is yeah. this notion of effective deterrence in digital asset financial integrity and crime fighting is critical. That th this is a living, breathing, open network where anyone with a basic internet connected device is a part of that looking glass that can hold accountability in check for the whole sector. You cannot do that with analog finance and traditional banking. By the time you find risk in traditional banking, you get what we got with Danske Bank and Russian money laundering, which was a $250 billion money laundering scandal out of the Latvian branch of Danske Bank. That is very hard to replicate in digital assets. Even if people might feel like they're getting away with bad activity, it's always discoverable in the end. And I think that that is a, an effective deterrence of illicit actors taking over these networks. Really well said. You know, I asked you what gets you out of bed. That's what gets me out of bed. It's how do we keep this ecosystem safe by targeting and going after illicit actors or working with law enforcement, working with regulators? Because really the key is this thing doesn't scale if North Korea is able to continue to steal you know, $600 million from a, from a bridge or a protocol. And when you talk about use cases, I talk all the time about AML as a use case, mm -hmm. right? It is a feature, not a bug uh, when it comes to blockchains. And mm -hmm. I know obviously at Circle, it has always been a major focus. I'm going in for the shameless plug because we work closely <laughs> together on this. Mm -hmm. But obviously it has been something that's been top of mind for you guys for a while. Caroline Hill, who's on your team, and I sat next together for you know a couple of years at Treasury working on these issues. And now she's on your team and we're all able to work closely together on these things. But it's, it's something that you guys have always prioritized. It is table stakes for rules-based, regulated, responsible financial services to care about the totality of the norms and expectations that cover sanctions, anti-money laundering, countering the finance of terrorism, and illicit actors being able to thrive. When Tornado Cash was sanctioned, Personally, I was among the very first leaders in the industry to make a call to action to the entire industry that any time good technology is co-opted by bad actors, the industry must mount collective defenses. Because at the same time that, that there are clear rules on the books about uh, illicit finance, there is this opportunity of open source financial markets infrastructure that can get lost. And it's a generational opportunity if the industry and the good actors and the developers and many others don't rally around rejecting good technology is being co-opted by bad actors or for bad activity. Because frankly, the national security imperative is a blunt force imperative. And by the time technologies like Tornado Cash or others get co-opted by illicit actors, the only solution the US government or other governments might have is a hammer. And to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so I think it's upon the industry and upon the good actors in the industry to actually mount reasonable collective defenses to ensuring that good technology doesn't get co-opted by bad actors. Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah str strongly agree. Last question, unscripted. So uh, <laughs> feel free to take this as you want. You are one of the most articulate, thoughtful leaders in our space. I was at my nephew's graduation very recently and listened to a, the commencement speech and thought to myself, I would love to sort of know from the folks that I sort of most respect in the world what they would say under these sort of circumstances, right? You're looking out there, there are 3,000 mostly undergraduates, some graduate students there. What do you say to those people as they're sort of stepping out into the world, a world that is more and more digital, mm. a world in which, frankly, you have been a tremendous leader? And I think a tremendous leader who's gotten at, to get out of bed every morning on a, on a really meaningful mission to themselves personally and professionally. What do we say to those folks? If I were addressing a commencement audience, knowing the juncture that they're at and knowing, frankly, my own journey to have overcome quite a lot of adversity and overcome fear of failure along the way, Yeah, is we're in a very, very profoundly uncertain world where the obligation to ensure that the world is better off is on individual people and individual leaders. You know, the narrative that you and I probably heard growing up was the obligation of a parent is to give a better world to their kids. And when I had kids of my own, I realized that actually our obligation as parents is not dissimilar to our obligation as leaders. It is to give better people to the world. And I think that done at scale, person by person, community by community, country by country, and then over the whole world is the thing that can make the biggest difference right now. Because while we have deep technological dependencies as a society, the COVID pandemic revealed how deep that dependency was here in the US. Classroom, political, economic, business continuity, all depended on technological access. The people who build it, how they wield it, and fundamentally what the terms of services are, are going to be defined by us as individual leaders right now. And that's the world this commencement group that you're describing, Ari, go into. 
And so we can't be afraid of technology. We have to figure out how to embrace it. But in the end, it is a tool. And what we build with it is literally entirely up to us. So beautifully said. I think what's really extraordinary about your story is the focus that you've had from a young age of bringing financial inclusion, of bringing opportunity to folks. And it's so cool that you've been able to professionalize that and become a leader. You and I were on a flight to San Francisco from DC about a year or so ago. And I think our listeners today more or less just got the last the five hours. Once Dante realized that he was like, oh crap, I'm sitting next to this guy and uh, and I wouldn't stop talking to you even though you put, kept putting those headphones on. I couldn't understand why you were doing that. Not only was I relegated to the headphones, I had to hit the flight attendant call button you know, ask everything, <laughs> but <laughs> no, I think you were going, you may have been going out to circles like first huge event. It was a great conversation. Honestly, not all that different than the one we've just had. So thank you for taking the time. Honestly, thank you for the role that you play in building a new and safer financial system. It's incredible to be on this journey with you. Here, here. Thank you so much, Ari. When you listen to Dante, he makes the optimistic case for crypto all the time. I am an eternal optimist in every aspect of my life and love talking to Dante, who sort of continuously makes the thoughtful, optimistic case for crypto, but also it's like so deeply rooted in who he is from his childhood up to the work that he's done. I, I try to explain to people that life is a series of adventures hashed to an immutable ledger of experience. What you're going to hear on this show is obviously a focus on stopping illicit actors, because that's so much of what we do at TRM. But you're going to hear from builders who are building a new financial system. We're going to live in, in an ecosystem of more choice. The promise of this technology is cross-border value transfer at the speed of the internet. And that's why it's so cool to hear Dante, because stable coins are certainly today the way payments are happening in the crypto space. Now, I think that there are some tough questions about use cases that need to be asked and will continue to ask on TRM Talks. Next on TRM Talks, I am joined by CFTC Commissioner Christy Goldsmith Romero. Thanks to all of you for joining TRM Talks today and for helping us build a safer financial system. If you love the show, leave a review wherever you're listening to it. For more crypto insights, you can also subscribe to the TRM Weekly Roundup at trmlabs.com. TRM Talks is brought to you by TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. This episode was produced in partnership with Voltage Productions. The music for this show was provided by Ecolix. Now, let's get back to building.